Do you want to stay up to date with the messiest drama on the internet? Or what about those crazy viral challenges? Then be sure to tune in to TMZ Verified, the podcast. I'm Wild. I'm Steph. And each week we're either breaking down the spicy viral stories or we're hanging out with the most popular influencers around. Tana Mojo is in the building. I don't even know if they're hating. They're probably just telling the truth, but we love the haters too. Sophia Franklin. Yeah, I mean, we can talk, but like, let's be real with each other, you know? Bryce Hall is here, y'all. Make some noise, people. I'm, I'm single, by the way. Right. So if you like viral drama, influencer culture, and just overall hot messness, check out new episodes of TMZ Verified every Thursday right here on Spotify. Five other cities are found in Polemoniacus Pontus, Neo Caesarea, Comana, Trapesus, Carassus, and Polemonium. For Pityus and Sebastopolis should be considered forts rather than cities. These then are the cities in the two provinces of Pontus. Back of these lies R. Lazica, with the city of Petrian, which we permitted to be a and to take the name of city and it uses the name of our piety, and is called Justiniana. There are also the large and ancient forts of Archaeopolis and Rhodopolis, and in that number belong the forts recovered by us from the Persians, namely those of Scondus, Serapanus, Mauritius, Lysiris, and other places acquired by us in Lazica. Then follows the region of Tsani, now under the control of our sway for the first time, which too has some cities recently built and will have others to be built soon hereafter. Other nations further back are the Suwani, Skimni, Opsili, Abaski, and others, now, by the grace of God, our friends and belonging to us. Justinian, Novella 28, Preface Thank you to Josh from Grand Dukes of the West. Gamarjoba, and welcome to the History of Sacadillo, Georgia. I'm your host, Roberto, and this is episode 32, A Prelude to War. In this episode, we will cover Persia's takeover of Lazica slash Igrisi with the assistance of Vakhtang Gorgasali, the Iberian War, and the issues that pushed the Lazi to break away from Byzantine control and kickstart the Lazic Wars. Just repeating this again, I am going to Georgia in late April and would like your support in helping mitigate research costs while I'm there. I want to take advantage of visiting historical sites, museums, buying books to benefit the show, and more, and would love your support. Every $100 donated will have me create a bonus episode based on something that I see in Georgia, and I will also be making a daily audio journal about my time there, probably released on a daily basis upon my return in mid-May. You can go to tinyurl.com slash trip S-A-Q-A-R-T-V-E-L-O-T-R-I-P, or follow the link in the episode description. Also, friend of the show, Becca Bagashvili from Hoda, Georgia, has released a few albums on Spotify that you should definitely check out. To paraphrase him, he makes groovy alternative rock as well as Georgian ballads. Now, let's get into the show. The Huns to the north were finally subdued. While in every other history book you've probably read, this would be considered a good thing. The opposite was true for the royal family of Lazica. The Persians, who were for so long distracted by the raiding parties north of the Caucasus in the steppe, 
could finally concentrate on taking over the rest of the Transcaucasia. Despite their alliance with the Romans, the Lazai army was severely beaten after the short war against Byzantium, which resulted in the abdication of Gubaz I. We have gone into detail about Gorgasali's campaigns in Lazica in previous episode, except now we're looking at it from a Lazican perspective. Gorgasali was a Kartveli king supported by the Persians, and despite his status as a Christian, he aimed to conquer Roman-controlled land on behalf of the Persian Empire. Gubaz I, under orders from his son, who is now the king, and whose name we don't know, was working with the Romans to deal with the Svanetian rebels in the north, who were attempting to conquer vital Lazai fortresses that would grant them control of the mountain region. The few successes in this matter were undone by the arrival of Gorgasali. The Kartveli army, with Persian backing, conquered Svaneti, followed by the important border territory of Argveti that divided the two nations. Gorgasali's campaigns in Igrisi united inner Igrisi and Svanetia with his territory, while the rest of Lazica fell under Persian control. Vakhtang placed a new duke in the conquered areas, and began making the churches in Igrisi more Kartvelian by installing kinsmen and subordinates as bishops. Gorgasali fought Byzantium so that he could have an autocephalous church in Kartli, especially after his quarrels with a Greek-appointed bishop led him to lose a tooth. No, really, he got kicked in the face by a bishop. Check episode 29. Although churches in Lazica would be of the Georgian ecclesiastical tradition, they ultimately remained under the purview of the Byzantines. Gorgasali also created an alliance with the Byzantines after their agreement to let him have an autocephalous church, and he returned the land to Lazica. Overall, Byzantine influence in the land remained minimal, and the Persians held on to the territories that the Kartveli king had conquered for them. Now that Lazica was under Persian control, major changes were on the way. While Christian monarchs were not persecuted, the Persians held an obvious pro-Zoroastrian bias in considering candidates for the throne, which ended up converting the Lazai nobility. However, this seemed to be nominal, because they always seemed to convert to Christianity or Zoroastrianism depending on what was the most expedient for gaining political power. Persian influence over the life of the nobility could only extend so far. By the early 520s, King Damnazes died and the Persians eagerly sought a replacement that would be favorable to their interest. This Damnazes' sons, Zath, decided that he did not want to live under the Persian yoke or undergo the many Zoroastrian religious rituals and sacrifices, so he fled to Constantinople. Once there, he met with the emperor, Justin. Zath was baptized as a Christian, and Justin was more than glad to crown him as a king of the Lazi and to cement their alliance, married Zath to the daughter of a Roman noblewoman, and her name was Valeriana, with the Lazai crown and a Roman wife in hand, he returned to Agrisi. Upon arrival in his home country, Zaph I debuted a brand new look. He wore a Byzantine royal crown upon his head. On his shoulders was a white cloak made of pure silk with a golden royal border along the edges. To top it off, Emperor Justin's face adorned the center. Beneath the cloak, he had a white tunic that was fashioned with golden embroidery and had a similar likeness of Emperor Justin. His scarlet boots, in the Persian style, was decorated with pearls, as was his belt. He also brought a plethora of gifts received from the emperor himself. If we compare this to the entirely Persian dress that Gubaz I had on his arrival to Constantinople, Zaf I was showcasing that he played for Team Byzantium. News of this spread quickly through Igrisi and straight to Shah Kavad's the first ears in Persia. The Shahan Shah was furious, especially since the Greeks had stolen their vassal out from under them. Kavad wrote a strongly worded envoy to Justin, saying, We have talked of friendship and peace between ourselves, and have created it. Now you behave like an enemy, for you have appointed a subject of mine, King of the Lazai, though that is no part of the Roman administration. Rather, it has been, since time immemorial, a matter for the Persian state. This led Justin to reply, We have not taken over, 
or won over any subject of your kingdom. Rather, a certain Zath came to me in my palace, and as a suppliant, begged me to save him from Zoroastrianism, from impious sacrifices, and the errors of demons, and begged to become a Christian, worthy of the power of the eternal God, creator of all things. We could not stand in the way of someone wishing to take a better course and to recognize the true God. When he had become a Christian, worthy of the heavenly mysteries, we sent him back to his own land. The discourse continued likewise between the two emperors, with Kavad asserting Sasanid dominance over Lazika. Justin appears to not even dispute this, but simply replies that Zath was voluntarily baptized. The Greek historian Procopius wrote that the Sasanid requests for Lazika were absurd, as it always led to a breakdown in communications between the two powers. The envoy who made the mistake of bringing up Persian claims on Lazika upon returning back to Persia was executed for pressing the issue. Kavad understood that once the Byzantines had made a move on Lazika, they would never budge. Kavad's assertion is not without merit. Lazai allegiance to Persia goes back to the days of ancient Colchis. We know Persia appointed Lazai kings, that is, until Zaf's defection to the Byzantines. Both the Byzantines and the Lazai chose to ignore this detail. Speaking of defections, the Kardveli were similarly unhappy under Persian rule. Gorgasali rebelled against his overlords and switched to the Byzantine side, marking the start of the Iberian War. This began when Shah Kavad decided to ban Christian burials and force Persian burial traditions, prompting Gorgasali to ask for Emperor Justin's support against the fire worshippers. Justin pledged to a system and sent a general named Petros to hire the Huns as mercenaries. As we recall in episode 29, Gorgasali was unable to fight the Persians, even with Roman assistance, and once injured in battle, he retreated to a fortress in Lazica to recoup his forces. While Gorgasali was out fighting the Persians, Emperor Justinian came into power and decided to make his mark on the war. In 528, he established a new Magister Militum per Menia et Pontum Polemoniacum et Gentis, which is a top-level military commander in Byzantium. This Magister Militum was named Sitas, and his job was to oversee the Armenian and Pontic territories, which included Lazica and the city of Pitsunda to the north. This allowed him to keep an eye on Lazican territory and brought Byzantine troops in Lazica under his command, greatly benefiting the Lazicans. Sitis' main objective, while he was the Magisid Militum of the region, was to put down the Zanoi tribe. The Zanoi tribe were an ancient Caucasian tribe also known as the Macrones, which lived in the Pontic mountain region near Trebizond. Their homeland soil was unfit for cultivation, so they traditionally practiced herding and often resorted to raids on cities and towns. To stop the Tsanoi raids, previous emperors had attempted to buy them off with a yearly subsidy, but Justinian aimed to end the threat once and for all. Sitas created a string of garrisons and fortresses along the Pontic territory, most importantly at Horonon, along the frontier with Persarmenia. This gave Sitas a base from which to attack the Tsanoi tribe. Victory over the Tsanoi allowed him to push them towards conversion to Christianity, as well as an opportunity to build roads into their mountain dwellings for ease of access, making putting them down all the easier. Overall, the Tsanoi would prove to be valuable allies to the Byzantines. Their traditions of pillaging and raiding made them into talented warriors useful for the upcoming Lazic War. The Lazai, on the other hand, remained untrustworthy and rather dangerous, leading the Byzantines to keep them at arm's length. The subjugation of the Tsanoi brought a sense of foreboding to the Lazai, as it showcased the lengths that Justinian would go to to enforce his interventionist policies, especially given the Byzantines' tendency to increase their demands and maintain their positions in Igrisi. During this period, the Iberian War continued raging and spilled over to, well, outside of the purview of what we would consider to be Iberia slash Kartli. Battles were often fought on Byzantine soil, 
led by Justinian's right-hand man, Belisarius, along with the armies of the aforementioned Magisent Militum Citas. Belisarius' victories at the Battle of Dara, Citas's at the Battle of Satala, and the capture of several key forts in Armenia allowed the Romans to push the Persian offensive away from the territory. However, all did not go well for the Romans, since Belisarius' defeat at Kalinicum saw him removed from the power in the area and returned to Rome, leading to an inconclusive end to the war. However, all did not go well for the Romans, since Belisarius' defeat at Kalinicum saw him removed from power in the area and returned to Rome, leading to an inconclusive end to the war. The Iberian War ended in a white peace. Lazica remained with Byzantium and Kartli remained with Persia. The Byzantines also had to make a payment to the Persians, and in exchange, the Persians acknowledged Zaf's defection to the Romans and ceded the forts of Skanda and Sarapanis over to Lazica. Overall, this ended a conflict that had been ongoing since the time of Anastasius and Kavad. With this, however, it was time for Justinian to consolidate Lazica and ensure that it was under his thumb. Roman soldiers continued to be garrisoned around Igrisi, and Justinian appointed Petros, the general who brought the Huns to fight on behalf of the Carvelli, as governor. According to Procopius, he was an avaricious man that treated everyone foolishly while in power. This led Justinian to replace him with another general named Ioannis Tsibus in 536. Tsibus asked for permission to build a city next to the Black Sea named Petrapia Justiniana, or Petra for short, not to be confused with the one in Jordan. This would allow Tsibus to set Petra as a trade hub where he would have complete control over the goods entering Lazica. Tsipus created a monopoly over salt and other daily necessities that were subsequently severely price gouged. The resultant income fueled Justinian's many construction projects. Tsipus would ultimately curtail the powers of the Lazai king in order to protect Byzantine interests. A bit about Petra, as it will show up in future episodes. According to historian David Brond, Petra is located between modern-day Batumi and Kobuleti, near the town of Sihis Ziri. A defensive wall and many buildings were built around pre-existing settlements. The walls stood parallel to each other, lower walls in front of higher ones. There was also a walled acropolis with rectangular towers. It held a basilica and a bathhouse, as well as a large cistern. Petra was placed well as a military strong point, as the coastal na road narrows near there before opening up onto the Colchian Plain, and allowed for some control of coastal shipping. However, it wasn't the most convenient route for movement into Lazica proper, since it didn't go along the Phasis slash Rione River. However, for controlling trade from Byzantium, Petra was perfectly placed due to its proximity to Byzantine-controlled areas. Procopius describes Zebus as a, quote, a man of obscure and ignoble descent who had attained high office and had been promoted to general for no reason other than that he was the most greatest villain in the world and most successful in discovering unjust sources of revenue. This man poisoned and destabilized all the relations of the Romans and the Lazoi. End quote. It's safe to say that Zebus did not ingratiate himself with the Lazai with his tactics, so King Gubaz II sent envoys to Persia to complain about Byzantine affairs in the region, stating, 1. How Zebus had taken away power from King Gubaz II and treated him as a mere servant who awaited orders from the general. 2. How he placed a multitude of soldiers in the land who, instead of guarding them against any threats, were the ones harassing, imprisoning, and robbing them of their possessions. And 3. How they stripped them of essential goods and sold them at inflated prices. The Lazai envoys appealed to the Persian sensibility of being a most ancient kingdom, and how having Lazica in their possession would allow the Persians to make use of the coast to build a fleet and attack Constantinople with ease, since they could avoid land routes entirely. They even promised to act as guides through the rough mountains and forest rain. They also promised the Persians. They also promised the Persians that they could build a supply route through the path that the Lazai showed them. Shah Hosro was more than encouraged by this letter and decided that he was going to move his troops into the region. 
Hosro gave word that he was headed for Iberia to settle an issue with the Huns, mainly to throw off any of Justinian's spies in the Persian court about his true intentions. And he marched towards Lazica. To connect with us, feel free to find us on social media under at history underscore Georgia or on Facebook at the history of Sacadvelo, Georgia. Our intro music is Bindisperia Sopeli by Zedashe. They will be touring the U.S. in September 2024, so please keep a lookout for them. We also had additional quotes read by John from Primetime and Dustin from the Alexander Standard. Thank you for your support. This is where I'd like to remind you of the ongoing GoFundMe to help support my trip to Georgia. To help this podcast continue, otherwise, please feel free to subscribe to our Patreon, where you can get episodes such as on Dali, the goddess of the hunt. You can get episodes on St. Nino uh, and just a few other saints, and we will be doing some food episodes soon. You can also donate via coffee or PayPal. All of those work. The links are in the episode description. If you would prefer donating something a bit more tangible, such as a book, we have an Amazon wishlist for you to peruse. But if you want to do something for free, the best way to help us is via review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast host, as it goes a long way with getting the word out about the show and helping us reach new people to learn about Georgia. Madloba da Nakfamdis, and thank you for listening to The History of Sacadvelo, Georgia. See you next time. <laughs> Ne vadi